1985, Vince McMahon's clearly taking over the wrestling world, um, getting into LA, getting into everybody's territories at the same time. Um, when was the first time you remember hearing about Pro Wrestling USA and who were the players involved and what did you make of their attempts to compete with Vince at that time? Okay, Pro Wrestling, yeah, that was where all the uh, promoters got together to run against Vince. Is that, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, I think it was uh, Jerry Jarrett, uh, Vern yes, Garnier, a couple of others, yeah. Okay, this is how we really, this is in 1984, I believe, because this is where me and Robert first went to uh, – uh for bill watts because you know every we did this in memphis like eddie rand uh, bill watts Vern Gagne, you know they all brought their top talent in to memphis to work well see so, you know jerry jarrett was was showboating the fabulous ones to see how they were over there in memphis and trying to get that uh me and robert we, we were there we were on the show uh and then after the show, we, we were wrestling, and me and Robert clicked, buddy. I'm not kidding you. We even put somebody over, uh, I think Ken Batera and uh, his partner, the big guy. I can't remember his name, but, but they were the AWA World Tag Team Champions. Uh, but when it was over, there was a meeting there, and and. They were talking about this and this and Eddie Graham. I never forget this. Eddie Graham stood up and he says, I don't know about y'all because everybody in here is featuring all your top workers. He says, I watched one match tonight it was the Rock and Roll Express. He said, I only owe y'all two boys. He said, y'all the greatest tag team I've ever seen. He said, because me, he says, you sewed. For 20 minutes, never buried your partner. And then when they beat you, they had to beat you. It's just the greatest thing I've ever seen. Well, Bill Watts was finishing up. He didn't want to wrestle no more. And he wanted a book. So he come to us. He says, I'm going to bring Bill Dundee in. Would you like to come to my territory and work? And that's when they shot the videos and sent them in there of us do we we wrote so that was my whole play on that but other than what bits back man uh taking up over the territory i didn't give a shit what he did because i knew one thing I, i'm always for the boys and, and that's when the guys went there at first it was hard but they made good money i can say this the one thing Vince back man paid the boys you know these something these guys are millionaires i mean do you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. See, I never had a contract like that. I got paid, you know, my whole time, the promoter always got the first count. And then you got off of it, uh, drawing the big houses like that. So my take of Vince doing this, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Because small territories, somebody like me and Robert, we, you, you never had a chance. Because you're not going to get over the booker or you're not going to get over the owner. That's the way it was. And the only way that you could ever get over is go in and steal the territory. And, and I'm serious. That's why they had opposition so many times. Uh, so as for me, in my opinion on this Matt man doing, it, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And I still do. Mm. And I just, you know, he's getting a lot of opportunities for guys. Were you, uh, were you courted by Vince McMahon in the eighties to come in at any point? No, no. Well, we were no, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, uh, I was wrestling for WCW and Robert got hurt. Uh, I might have said this a many times. You might have heard this. You want to go for a long walk down the road? Please. I'm sitting back. Okay. Let's go for a long walk down the road. WCW come in and they were trying to do everything they could to tear us apart. Well, I'm sitting in Knoxville. Okay. And Robert's sitting over against the wall. Robert's real quiet. And uh, so I walked over to him and I asked us, come you what's the matter with you, bro? He goes, I got hurt last night in the ring. And uh, I came back over and I went. I'm thinking to myself, well, you didn't even get in the ring. How'd you get hurt? You know, but I, you know, then all the boys go out. Then I go over there to him. I said, Robert, uh, what happened to your leg? And 
and I tell you, he said my wife ran over me in the car. <laughs> and, oh, she did. So he pulled his britches down. I'm not kidding. His whole leg was black and blue. And uh, see, we wasn't on contract. You hear me? Nobody else was. But it was owned by WCW, Ted Turner. Uh, so I uh, I told Robert, I says, you, when I go to the ring tonight, I play our music. He can't even walk, Carly. I says, we're wrestling Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. And I didn't say nothing because you did. I said, when they play our music, I'm going to shoot out that curtain. I'm going to go through the people, do our stuff. And I says, you get to the ring and get your ass up on the side of that ring, no matter how bad it hurts or what you do. So, uh, boy, I'm out there. I get him. And I see Robert on the side of the ring. And I go to the ring. I start the match off. But I told him, I says, uh, when I tag you in, come in and fall. You know, you, your knee, because you got hurt in the ring. Well, that's exactly what happened. I tagged him. He went down. Boom. His leg was bone. He got hurt in the ring. So, WCW sent him to the University of Alabama with the best knee surgeon in the world was. They paid him $2,000 a week. Everything paid for for a year. Okay. Now, now here I am. I, uh, I have nowhere to go. Okay. So either they wanted, they said they'd give me a contract if I would team up with Brett Armstrong and be the new Rock and Roll Express. And if that, they didn't really have nothing for me, but they would put me with Terry Taylor as the York Foundation. So I went with Terry Taylor's York Foundation. And then, but where I'm working to, and I'm not trying to make, because this is a, about us going to the WWE. We left, as soon as Robert came back, I beat him at Capital Punishment when I, at the York Foundation. With the, thing. the next day, me and him left and went to Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Hmm. Jimmy Cornette opened up Smoky Mountain. Okay, and let's say we was there for like three years, and, and Jimmy, uh, the, the company shut down. But we was loyal to Jimmy, and we did good business. It was just a small territory. You couldn't compete with television as it was going up. You, you couldn't do that unless you was a big corporate company or big corporate business with million-dollar sponsors. So we didn't have a job, but Jimmy was going to WWF. So Jimmy got us a job, and that's the reason we went there. What wasn't nothing – that was good because when we got there, you know, you got a million guys wrestling. So nobody called us. Jimmy Cornette took care of us. He got us a job. We didn't get a contract, but we made $500 a week, even if we didn't wrestle. And then when we did do the shows, we got our $500 a week plus paid for those shows. And, and Vince was a good payoff guy. You know, I, I know we went to, uh, you know, to Germany, Switzerland, and all over there for like four days. And, you know, I think I got paid like seven grand. I'm like, holy shit, that's a lot of money, you know, for me. And, uh, but that was the whole thing about Warner. Jimmy Cornette took care of us. He got us a job. And then, you know, and then being lost in a shuffle, our time ran out. And then I found out that we could do a twice as better on the independent circuit. And man, Robert's been on the independent circuit ever since then. And plus going to Japan a lot so at that time. So yep. that was my thing about WWF. Yep. They didn't call us. Jimmy Cornette got us a job. So I'm glad you listened to that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know, it sort of brings into the first time I saw you. So uh, when I was watching wrestling in 98, uh, I watched for a few, uh, you know, a little bit in 93 and beyond, fell out of it and then started watching again in 98. And uh -huh. I remember watching you as part of the NWA invasion. And yes. at, the, at the same time on Sky Sports, which is where all the WWF stuff was, they, they were also showing WCW Classic from uh, 1990. And so you're uh -huh. in the York Foundation there. 
and then you're in the NWA sort of weird invasion thing at the time. Yes. And, Me, uh, Robert, Jerry, Jerry. I mean, Jeff, Jerry, Barry Wyndham. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and I was just thinking, do you know what? When I look back on the 80s stuff, when I was a bit older, I was like, God damn, the Rock and Roll Express were great. And they just weren't doing anything with you. They had you in a feud with the Headbangers, I think, at the time, for the most part, yeah, in 98. Yeah, you know, yes. yeah, we had a few matches there. They were great guys, too. Yeah. They were good to work with, uh, but they had no plans for us. So. And it was good. And I'm glad you said that because, you know, somebody I seen it hit on something on uh, Twitter the other day about they were watching the Fantastics wrestle the Bushwhackers. And then they said it, it clicks to the Rock and Roll Express watching wrestling the Bushwhackers. And it says it's like Tommy Rogers and Bobby Fulton were in slow motion. <laughs> and the Rock and Roll Express is all over the place. You know, that's, that's a good compliment. But don't get me wrong. I love the Fantastics, Bobby and Tommy. Uh, it was just saying that back in those days, comparing us and – and stuff that we did, that we did, we had some of the greatest matches in the world just underneath cards. Mm. And, and it couldn't compare with the uh, new Midnight Express of uh, Bob Holly and um, Bart Gunn. Because that was the only exposure at the time that I had to the Rock and Roll Express and Midnight Express was the yeah, fake uh, Midnight Express at the time. Yeah, Jimmy Cornett came up with that. But Jimmy, you know, but Jimmy, I think, kind of managed this. But you see, it was all right because I got paid. And the you extra know? exposure as well. I, mean, it, I bet yeah. that like upped your indie um, uh, wages as well, massively, just being on national TV. Yes. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it's different, really. Different. You know, when I, when we went to uh, overseas, I mean, not to Japan at all, I'm talking about like to Germany or Switzerland, we were heels. People didn't like it. <laughs> you know that? <laughs> they, but they cheered the hills there. That was a whole different thing. I, I'll never forget that. You know, they, they cheer the heck out of them. Well, we, <laughs> but they booed the shit out of us too. <laughs> <laughs> the same way, yeah. you know, you go to Canada, man, they cheered the damn, ba- uh, the hills and boo the baby. Face. Oh, were you on that ill-fated trip to Canada with a uh, NWA WCW? Well, when the, when the plane caught on fire, that wasn't okay, what I, I was thinking, I'm, but I've got I've gotten even well. Go it sounds better. That sounds like a better story than what I was hinting at. No, no, no. Ask me the first one first, and I go into the second. One. Ah, I just it's something in the back of my mind. Um, I think just the houses didn't work out, and then apparently one of the arenas like had some toxic, toxic, toxic substance in, and they had to evacuate the entire arena, and everyone had to go home. No, I don't. I don't know nothing about that. I just know that. Uh, we were flying back from Canada one night and Barb Armstrong had a broke arm. And then all of a sudden the plane starts smoking. You hear me? And Bob with one arm in this couch is boated. He jerked that couch up to put that fire out behind it. And here's Rick rude. He runs to the back and gets a big bottle of, uh, Xanaxes and he's pouring them in the sand. I said, "What are you doing?" He goes, "I'm going to die before I hit the ground." <laughs> but, but they, but we made emergency landing out in the middle. And buddy, let me tell you something: when we landed, there was snow drills had to be ten feet high on both sides because it's in the middle of winter. And we landed there. We went to a little, like, a little bitty airport. I mean, no bigger than a McDonald's, and and a freezing. God, I'm freezing on there until they got out there and got another plane to take us back home. We sat there all night. But that's my, my worst story about Canada. <laughs> okay. That's what I was bad than what I was bringing up. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm yeah. gonna to throw a couple more questions and we're going to gonna go into the uh, uh, main event, so to speak. Uh, but I can't let you go without you giving me a funny story or two about Jim Hurd. Jim Hurd. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, Jim Hurd, you know, he's the greatest. He's one of the prime examples I was talking about earlier. They wanted to put somebody in charge that wasn't a wrestler, somebody that was corporate. Now, he run a pizza place, I think, out in St. Louis or somewhere. And they brought Jim Hurd in to do the wrestling. 
Now, his greatest thing, accomplishment, when he first come in, a new tag team. We are going to have the ding-dongs from Bellsville. And I look here, I'm like, what the fuck? What is he thinking? <laughs> you know, and what the fuck? So now I'm trying my best. I'm giving good matches and I'm working hard underneath. And a lot of things you might not know but about me, but you do know. I have a great match with Brian Pillman. And then he, he somebody says, Jim Hurd wants to see you. He wants to talk to you tonight. And I went, holy shit, that's cool, man. I might, he might give me a little break and might appreciate my work I'm doing. So I, <laughs> I walk into his office and he looks at me and he throws a pen down. And he goes, I want to know how come you did the Frankensteiner. And I stepped back and I looked I says, what are you talking about me doing the Frankensteiner? You did the Frankensteiner. And then he showed it to me. I just, you know, I did a, a hurricane ground. That, but I didn't, but I told Jim Hurd this. I go, uh, I said, a Frankensteiner? I says, no, what I did was a hurricane corona. It's a front head scissors. And I invented it. <laughs> and he looked at me real funny. He goes, Okay, that's all I want. <laughs> I swear to God. And I never seen him nowhere. Everywhere he was at, I wasn't around. You know, he was, you know, Jim Hurd is caught up in that uh, corporate business and he just spending money. You know, he'd call Jerry. Jerry told me, you know, to act like his, he would call Jerry and fly to Nashville from Atlanta and then sit in the airport and talk. And he goes, we never even talked about wrestling. <laughs> and then you get back on a plane, fly back to Atlanta. That was his business trip that day, huh. you know, just to sit in there and drink, I guess. So that goes, is Jim Hurd still alive or do you know? Jim Hurd is still alive. He must be like 90 now, but he's still alive and he's still got hair. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's, uh, I got half a mullet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I didn't know that. I, I, I know him and Jimmy Cornette used to have some great interview fights. Uh, but you know, Jim, Jimmy hated him. <laughs> well, he hates anybody that thinks they know about wrestling. They don't, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I thought it was funny as shit. Yeah. I, I've got to ask you one more and then we'll go into the grand finale of uh, the yeah. thingy. The first time Jim Cornette went, went into a complete meltdown that you saw. Uh, let me think back here because I've seen him in a thousand different meltdowns. You know, I, I, I'm going to say this for a fact. You know, Jimmy, before he got into business, he was a pitcher taker in Louisville, Kentucky, around the roof. And everybody hated that motherfucker. I hated him. <laughs> but I got my pitchers from him. He made my pitchers every week that we couldn't go out and sign them, but they had a table we'd put them on and sign them. And, and uh, we would make uh, good money off that. Uh, you know, and Jerry, Jerry told me, I'm this is before we started around. He says, listen, let me tell you something. If I can get as much heat on you with the people as you do with the boys, we're going to make a million dollars. And he did. But to see Jimmy just absolutely uh, flip out. I, I'm, wow. I'm trying as my dog jumped. I'm trying to. Uh, I see him just flip out of so many. Oh, gosh. <laughs> We were doing. Uh, it's got to be a good one. This now. Yeah, we <laughs> we were, we were doing a match down in uh, Homer, Louisiana, and Jim, they, that night he's going to hang because he's always interfering. He's going to hang above the ring, and not we didn't know. So they get there, and you don't rehearse this stuff. You understand me? We don't get to rehearse nothing. We don't get to do this. Jimmy's scared of heights. Again, and two of them. I should show you two of them here because it reminds me of the other one too. It, Jimmy's scared of heights. So we get out there and get ready to wrestle. And they put one of these strap things on him with a hook on the back. And they hooked him up. They pulled him up off the ring. 
and I guess it's got his nuts pinched, and you can't <laughs> hear him. <laughs> this <laughs> bitch, he's up there screaming, five motherfucker, go home, y'all. Oh, I mean, this went on and on, and they let him down, and uh, Jesus Christ, he cussed every son of a bitch in that building. But in Houston, Texas, they had a steel cage, and and in, in Houston, we used to draw unbelievable people. So this same thing, they made a steel cage when they put that strap on, and they got him up over the ring. Well, Robert gets on this top turnbuckle, and he dives, and grabs the cage, and swings, <laughs> <laughs> and it's swinging back. And Jimmy's in that steel cage, right? I, I look out there and he's going, fuck oh, yeah. <laughs> and you could hear him all over the building. You, I hate you, motherfucker. And it was the same thing. We had the match because, you know, it was a blow off him in that cage. And they let him down. And Jesus Christ. He was cussing Bobby Dennis. Buddy Landale, Buddy Lee, he was cutting interviews on everybody. And I just ran out the back door. I ran to the dressing room, by the way, because it was so hilarious. But Jimmy, I mean, he turned bipolar, bro. But <laughs> he turns bipolar every day now, so it's nothing new. The people <laughs> it's nothing new. It. it just speeds up back and forth more. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> um, just because you mentioned him, why did Dennis Condry leave the Midnight Express? It's never been I said don't know. publicly. I don't know. And I still don't know. And you know why I did not? I figured it was none of my business. You know, I, I loved it. Dennis was, you know, Dennis taught all of us, you know, back when we did our angles with, with the Midnight Express and Cornette and, you know, Dennis was, he directed traffic. I don't know if you know that or not. He was the big deal of the business. And this all of a sudden, Vince, please quit calling me. And uh, I, uh, you know, and I just don't know. I mean, all I know is I wrestled him one night and he wasn't there the next night. And uh, and then uh, the uh, next day later, Stan Lane was in. But it didn't, like I told you earlier, it's very hard to ever do something like that to replace somebody with somebody else. But Stan being that good looking heel and that charisma and that talk he had, you know, it instantly made him. And it, it and, and our angle never stopped. It went right. I mean, it, and we still selling out. Greatest thing in the world. I will. But I don't um, know. We, we get back. I don't know why. Yeah. I never asked. Him. Um, I, I know that uh, Dennis only told Jim and Stan in the 2000s, and they've both said, we'll never tell anyone else. So whatever it was, only a few people know. Uh, I don't know. No. I, I don't. Uh, it had to be something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something, it, it would have been something yeah. big. Whatever it was, it was something big. He was gone for a long time. I did see him for maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm serious. Yeah. I'll, uh... you know, Dennis has cancer now. You know, he's got Oh, a... he doesn't, does he? Yeah, he has uh... a one of those hoes in his... Uh-oh, what happened here? Oh, I'm still good here. Okay, I'm going to push cancel on that. Oh, there you go. So, uh, you know, he has a hole here that he talks like that. But, but it's okay. Hmm. You know, I love Dennis. You know, we said we all got over, <laughs> you know. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go for the uh, big finale of the podcast and I'm going to let you go uh, because... Uh, I'm here with you, go it's ahead. All, it's, all, it's all good and I'm, I'm so massively enjoying this as well. I've had two great interviews today, you and Tom Pritchard as well. So the um, fi finale that I always do, or nearly always do, call it the firing line and uh, sort of like before, except that I'm going to give you the names of some wrestlers uh, that you, um, I believe, hopefully work with, at least or at least new. Uh, you tell me what you think about them and if a funny story happens to... If it tumble from your lips, then so be it. And the first one is Jimmy Golden. Jimmy Golden. I, I remember Jimmy when he was breaking in. I love Jimmy. Uh, you know, Jimmy, his daddy was a promoter down in uh, Alabama. 
uh, when he first started into the business. And I remember Jimmy, he, it was hard to get into our business and you had to start uh matter of fact, you refereed. And I, I remember Jimmy back when he refereed uh, in matches, uh, Jimmy, uh, I don't know. I love him, but I never was with him a lot on the road. I never traveled with him to, to do anything. So I know I had some great matches with him. Uh, I know when we first came into Smoky Mountain, him and Robert Fuller was, uh, you know, a, a tag team. And, and holy crap, you know, and, and Jimmy pushed us like that. And, I, and, and the fans, they would come in the rink. You know, I mean, it's, that's things that you don't understand about wrestling. And maybe later on, you can ask me a question. Is is these guys had so much heat that every time we wrestled him and Robert, that the fans would come into the ring and they had, they had to grab them, throw them out. But Jimmy Golden's, I, I, I loved him, and I loved him when he come Buck House Buck too. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the guy uh, when we started talking, Adrian Street. Adrian Street. Uh, I seen him a couple of times. You know, Adrian was so good of of a worker that he could work your cheek here. I don't know if you ever seen him do that. Go to some of his matches, and he hit he'd work the cheek. He'd grab you on the cheek and work it, and go. You know, you maybe face a bank about, and he'd go right back to it and get it. Uh, but Adrian, I, I seen him one time. Tommy Rogers, I don't know. He they did something, and Tommy Rogers. <laughs> You know, he tried Adrian in the ring. Oh, oh and no. Adrian just, hey, just in about two seconds, you know, uh, brother knew what the hell have I got into. But I've seen Adrian do that a, to a couple of guys. Uh, he'd take them down. You know, man, he's from, you know, especially in the 80s, the gimmick he had, you had to be tough to have that gimmick because he lived his gimmick 24 hours a day him and miss linda you know miss linda was tough i wouldn't mess with her <laughs> you know so but i uh, uh adrian was another good one i, I mean I, he came here to the states and it, he made his mark in our wrestling business especially in the florida area he did good i love I, I, he was a tough shooter he's a tough guy yeah he was doing that character here in the 60s and, uh -huh. you know, if you thought he wasn't tolerant in the 80s, God, in the 60s. So, I mean, uh -huh. you, you've got to be tough if you're going to pull that off. Oh, yes. you you got to. I love Adrian. Adrian. Him and Linda both were my friends. Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Hump was redheaded. And it don't matter. Uh, you know, I have a wrestling school. Of course, School of Morton. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is, is when you walk through my door, I don't care what color you are or what ginger you are, we're all the same. And that, and that's the way in life. I think it should be like that everywhere. You know what I'm saying? But see, Hump, I don't know if you know this, you know, Hump was gay. Uh, but I knew that back then. And Hump knew that I knew that. But this Hawaii can't fade it. And I always used to tell him, I said, man, be, be you. I mean, if you can't be you, it's no need, you know, to try to be somebody else. Just be you. And, and Hump respected me for that. Uh, he, he had the natural heat, too. I mean, he was real good. What a talker he was. If you really sit down and listen to his interviews, sometimes, it, you know, it would it'd get pretty heavy sometimes. But uh, I loved Hump for what he was. And I, I liked him. I didn't, he was in the NWA territory when we first went there and then, but he left after a while, I guess. And he went back to, back to Florida. And Plowboy Frazier. Hey man. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever realize how big he was? He was a I big mean, boy. Did... I saw him on um, the old Saturday night's main events, kissing uh, oh. his real life wife, I think. Yes. Now listen to me. This guy was, you know, he was seven, four, something like that. 300. But he was a big guy, old country fucker. And uh, <laughs> years ago in Memphis territory, he used to rob some, some old buildings. Uh, matter of fact, I'll tell you how old they were. The light over the ring was in a wash tub with a big old light bulb, you know, <laughs> hot. 
<laughs> you get up under winter time, it'd be hot. And we used to uh, hit the light in the ring because when it would swing, the whole ring would go black. Because I ever light the building was off and it'd go and a lie to be over here, a lie to be over here. We just do it for the meanness just to do it. But I'm wrestling uh, Plowboy, you know, and I was a young baby face at the time, and I went to the ring. You know what? He could work too, buddy, because – and when you go to the ring with a guy seven foot four or 500 pounds, uh, and he'd make you look like that you could beat him, that was unbelievable. But <laughs> – when you come out of the dress center and he had to come up a hill in this old building and had a big old two by four that went across it. And I'm standing in the ring and he come up that thing. When he did, he raised up the people, his head hit that two by four. Look here. And it, and it I mean, I'm serious. It knocked his feet up over him. <laughs> he fell flat back and, you know, it's on a ramp. Like, I, I'm and honest to goodness, I thought the building shook, but he was totally knocked out. He couldn't even get, I mean, they couldn't move him. They couldn't get him up. They couldn't do nothing with him. He's like Andre laying there in the floor. Big son of a gun had to call him Lynch and everything. It just not, I mean, to, but you have to be in the ring to imagine this and see it. But I love Flyboy Frazier. You know, he was a hustler too, but. Yeah, didn't he have, like, have watches for sale always? Well, or you know, I was like to say that, but I, you know, oh, yeah, in the dressing room, you have them fake Rolexes, you know, uh, all of them, you know, it's, uh, and then uh, he, he was always selling something. Mm. Always. He was a hustler. He was making some money, you know. Uh, just speaking of uh, large men, I've not even got this written down because I can't remember their names off the top of my head. The, the twins, the really big fat twins on the little motorcycles. Did you ever, and they did wrestling matches as well. twins. the Maguire twins. Did you ever see yeah. them? Yes, I saw them when I was a kid. They brought, they would, uh, it was Benny and the other one. Uh, yes, I met them, but uh, one of them, well, one of them died. But they had, when they went to the ring, you know, they couldn't stand up. And, I mean, to get into the ring. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. They had to take the bottom rope off. They rode mini bikes to the ring and that they lay on their back and roll in the ring because they were so big. And, uh, and that, you know, they left the bottom rope off. And, you know, you didn't do nothing with them. The guy, you know, they were, uh, you know, showmanships. But it was weird watching them ride those little mini bikes to the ring. I, you know, I still didn't understand how they got on the damn things because they were so big. And I know when the first one died, they had to bury him in a piano box, I think. And then that, but the other one eventually died. But they were, hmm. they were some, I was just, but see, I wasn't in, I was before my time. Uh, I'm going to give you Ricky Gibson. Ricky Gibson, hmm. he was, uh, that's Robert's brother. Ricky Gibson was one of the best workers at his time. You know, and that's another one. You know, Harley Race wanted to put the world belt on Ricky. Uh, I didn't know if you knew that or not. No, I didn't. I mean, he, oh, yes. He talked a lot to Pat O'Connor and NWA, but they, it's the same thing, though. They didn't want to get somebody over that was young and great wrestler. I, you know, our, our business, they, they thought that he didn't deserve to be that, but I know Harley went to bat for him a couple of times. Uh, to be they weren't Harley wanted to put the belt on, you know, because to, to draw money, uh, you know, him and Ricky was phenomenal, you know, he was the first one to I think drop kick off the top rope. He is uh, he threw the prettiest drop kick in the world, too. Uh, him and Jerry Lawler had a hell of a run in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh. But you know, this, you know, Ricky was a. Like I said, he was always good to me. I mean, he's a river, mess with you all the time. But you know, he he got hit by a drunk guy, and it eventually killed him. You know, he died from that eventually. But he was a uh, another underrated wrestler that nobody ever had the chance to really see. Hmm. Uh, Buzz Sawyer. Crazy. Like him and Tommy Rich. I mean, they would work. <laughs> Mad dog. 
Leonard Sawyer. I, I like Buzz. He was a hard worker. I, if you go back and watch the tapes, he was one of the first ones that were, that kind of worked really stiff and really hard. He worked hard in the ring. Uh, even if he, you know, and he liked to. Do you know what Copenhagen is? Yep. Um, yep. No, I know, the, I know the city, but no. Okay. Okay. No, no. But they have Copenhagen. It's tobacco, but it's okay. the main event. You hear me? It's not. The, the beginner stuff. It's the main event. And uh, me and Robert are driving down the road and Robert chewed Copenhagen, but he could chew it and drink beer. He would spit tobacco juice in this bottle and drink a beer out of this one. But we'll buzz Sawyer's in the back. And he goes, what you chewing? Right. And he goes, give me some of that. Robert says, you sure you ever chewed? He says, no. He said, let me give me some. So he puts a big thing in his mouth. And I'm driving, and it's raining, and all of a sudden he goes, pull over, pull over. We pull over, and he rolls out of the car. It's pouring down rain, and he's laying in a, like a, a little ditch, and it's got water running through it. And I'm telling him, man, get up out of that ditch, man. Ron, he says, hell no, it feels so good. And, and he said, he said, my the world won't stop turning. Not only he's throwing up. That's funny shit to see that. You ever seen anybody chew tobacco? And get... I, it was never really a thing over here that chewing tobacco. I don't think I have seen it, but not many yeah. people use it. But uh, I mean, it'll tear you a new asshole, man. It'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it, oh, he was tore up. But Buzz was a. Uh, I liked him. I liked his brother too. They they were did, both good workers. Did you ever like? Because a big thing over here, like with the older generation, was snuff. Um, I don't know if you have that over there or what, but it was something. It was almost like you you snorted it, put a bit on you know, right up dip, your nose. Yeah, I mean, was it, anyone like a big snuff dipper? No, I no, I didn't. You know, I know what you're talking about. I, but I never did that either. You know, but I I got to chew in. But got the chewing got me to smoke. You know, I smoked cigarettes for a long time, 30 years. But I quit 10 years ago. I had the uh, best thing I ever did in my life. But it got me smoking from dipping that the nicotine. And, I, you know, I hate to even be around a cigarette now. Yeah. It's uh, it's like third most addictive thing between, like, heroin and morphine or something like that. It's crazy uh, okay. hard to get off. You know what? It didn't. And, and, and I tried for 30 years, you know, you, if, if somebody tells you they're going to quit Monday, <laughs> then now you, <Yeah. laughs> you, you got to have something to click in your mind, your head. That's what happened to me. Yeah. You, yeah. You got to see it to believe it when someone quits. I'll give you a few more. Um, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett. Mm -hmm. I knew him since he was a kid. Man. You know, he, uh, his daddy owned uh, Memphis Territory. Uh, I watched uh, Jeff bloom and blossom into this ring, into this business. It's very hard when your dad's promoted to break into the business. Mm. And, and it really is. You know, I have a son that's that's breaking into business, but he, but I won't let him right now. He's got a four-year scholarship to college and he's going to get his education. Uh, and it's hard for him too because you know, a lot of people think that you uh, you get more better treatment than they did and they do, but it, it, it you don't really. When you're a promoter's son, it's really it's it's hard, and, and, and then it's hard to follow in the footsteps of your parents. So I got to hand this to Jeff. Jeff handled it real good, and Jeff's really a good guy. I think he still works for WWE uh, behind the scenes. Uh, I don't know. I hadn't seen him in a long time, but uh, I always liked Jeff. Uh, like I told you earlier, I always treated people the way they treated me. If you're nice, I was nice about it. Well, I mean, you know, it, it helps that he had talents rather than someone like, let's say, George Goulas. <laughs> you know what? And, and, and that's the thing that I'm trying to make you understand in our business the guys that work so hard to get their spot, but then their dad is, you know, Nick, George Goulas was so horrible. And I'm serious. Uh, he was in a, it was really an embarrassment to be around. Uh, 
I remember I got, he fired me one time because a girl came over and talked to me that he liked. And I had no interest in it. You know what I'm saying? She just come over and was talking to him. And I said, yeah, how you doing? He fired me. <laughs> you idiot. What's wrong with you? You know, you dumbass. Uh, but he, he was an embarrassment for our business. You know what? And I watched Harley race. See, that's what makes good workers, I was telling you, even about Flyboy, to make everything believable. I watched Harley Race have a match with him, and he made the people believe that George could beat him. That, does that tell you how good of a worker Harley Race was? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was embarrassed. Uh, I'm glad that his thing was over because, you know, him and Bobby Eaton were jet set at one time, and I, I used to feel so bad for Bobby because Bobby had to do everything. But it's, uh, but it, it's course ran out, and I'm glad it did. But it was the that was the perks of owning your own territory. Yeah, Bobby, push yourself. Bobby push Eaton's myself. such a like nice chap and everything. But even he must have like confided in you after the fact. It was like, thank God I got out of that one. Oh yes, I mean, but he had a job and breaking into the business. You know, uh, at that time, our business has been at the right place at the right time. You know, and, and Bobby worked it. He went, you know, and then all of a sudden he was at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Got all the experience he needed and, and needed and to work on top. And, uh, you know, Bobby Eaton's one of the kind of guys that you know, I, I don't think I ever heard anybody say anything bad about him. It's what kind of guy he is. And I love him. You know, Buster's heart, his wife just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so uh, it was uh, a good thing. Bobby's. I think that he should be in the top ten. They should be in the Hall of Fame. Okay, but that's what it is. Uh, probably about five more. Um, Buddy Landell. Go ahead. What's that now? Nature Boy Buddy Landell. Nature Boy Buddy Landell. <laughs> you know, uh, Buddy, and, and I hate to say this, it's been a couple of them. Uh, Buddy, did, he only lived about 35 miles from me here. He lived in a little place called Chihuahua, Virginia. Uh, he was at my school that afternoon, of the night he died, six years ago, matter of fact, uh, in June. It was six years ago. He was at my school. But Buddy Landale, even though he did the Nature Boy gimmick like Ric Flair, it was a natural thing for him. A buddy was an unbelievable worker too, and to be in a lot of territories where he worked underneath, and he had more heat than the top heels did because Buddy knew how to get heat. Uh, you know, Buddy knew how to run that mouth. He knew how to talk. Uh, I say, <laughs> you know, he got himself in a lot of trouble a lot of times by talking. Yeah, uh, but uh, he made he made his mark in his business too. A lot of guys have forgotten about, and I'm glad that you mentioned Buddy Owen here around. And people go back to look at some of this. Him and Butch Reed was, were together, tag team. And and when Robert and I went into Louisiana, you know, it's the same thing, Dusty. We first worked with Nikolai Volkov, the Russians, and we got that. And then we worked with Buddy Landell and Butch Reed to get us ready for the Midnight Express. And that's what, you know, and Buddy knew his job. And when people know your job in this business, uh, that's when it's so fun. And when you go out there, you have no problems. You know what's going on. Uh, but Buddy was a great work. I love Buddy Land. Uh, I also mentioned Buddy to uh, Dr. Tom uh, a few hours ago. And he said uh, he and Rick Flair were going to obviously have the natural uh, singles uh, run together. And then Buddy somehow managed to, paranoid himself out of the entire situation. They never had that big run. Do you remember anything about that? Well, well I remember the run they had in NWA, what was there. The, you know, they went to uh, – the. I don't remember nothing being said about it, but Buddy running that mouth, you know, I, I love Buddy, but he talked too much, you know, and uh, behind the scenes and stuff. And sometimes it's just good to be quiet. I don't mm -hmm. know about that. Because I'm seriously in my business, I stuck to my own stuff. That way, I didn't have heat with the boys. I didn't have to get into there. But uh, but I know he had a run with Ric Flair. I, I, I never forget 
that he wrestled, Buddy and Rick wrestled in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And they had, at that time, the biggest house they ever had in Raleigh. Until me and Rick hit angle, we and we top we topped it. But then I ain't saying it because of me, but I was saying it was because I was at the right place at the right time, and that's what it's all about. But I, I don't know anything other than that. You know, Buddy. You know, he uh, stayed messed up. You know, being you know, listen, I can't throw the first stone at nobody, uh, but I knew when enough was enough. Hmm. Okay. Okay, that's <laughs> that's fair enough. Then. Um, someone I know nothing about, uh, pork chop cash. Pork chop cash. He, uh, you know, I just seen pork chop cash. We did a couple years ago before the pandemic with the AEW did a mm-hmm. special show in Memphis, right out well in Mississippi, but it's right outside of Memphis. And pork chop, I seen it. He come to the show, and. Uh, I went and got him. I seen him out there, and I went and got him and brought him in the back to uh, to meet everybody. Uh, and uh, you know, it wasn't and they 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 opened their arms up. To them. It was great when they brought him back there. But he wasn't part of the of the Memphis thing. So, but I went and got him. But in our day, that was who Robert and I. When we first went into Memphis, we, our first thing we did with was with Pork Chop Cash and Troy Graham, which were the Bruise Brothers. Uh, they're the ones that got me and Robert over at the first time, but we had a heck of a run with them. It, and working in your small town spot shows is whether you call them. But Tor- Pork Chop was great. Yeah, oh man, he was God. He was he 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 get in a hurry talking and uh he do an interview i'll never forget the the weak link of the chain you understand and he's doing an interview on me ricky morton you're the link link of the link you're the link man <laughs> and this went on forever and this is live tv i'm sitting in the back crying <laughs> i was laughing so hard <laughs> Finally, Lance Russell covered it up for him. But uh, Pork Chop Cash is a great one. He's still out. I mean, he don't work no more. He's an older guy, but uh, he's got to be in his 70s, too, uh, 75s, 78s. Yeah, well, it's nice that he's, he's nice that he's doing well, apparently, and he's going to yeah. AEW and everything, so that's good news. Um, yeah. I'm going to give you Thunderbolt Patterson. Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt Patterson. You know what? He, uh, he was a really – the first black man to ever really get a, the biggest push he ever got. See, and, and, and that was his greatest thing in the world. And he was in Atlanta, Georgia. But Thunderbolt, I, I love Thunderbolt too. But he was, I mean, if you go back and watch watch him work, show business, blah, blah. He knew how to reach up there and just grab them and pull them right in. I mean, you know, he, he did the 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 dance, the fun, all this stuff in the ring. He was one of the first black guys, really. I mean, to ever. I mean, they sold off Omni to the land of Georgia. You know, him Thunderbolt against the people. I, I uh, very entertaining man, and you know, he's a very religious guy now. Thunderbolt is. I haven't seen him since the pandemic, but he'll probably come out pretty soon. Coming out, great. Yeah, he uh, he made like a big comeback, didn't he? And uh, or like a brief comeback. And like, was it like the mid eighties or late eighties in NWA WCW for like a brief time? He, he yeah, out. he was just on TV there, but I don't know. You know, that's another thing. I seen him. I, I was gone at that time. I left, or I was doing something else. I just. Uh, but it is, I mean, I'm talking in the 70s here, but you know, <laughs> you know, you had to have that top block star, especially in Atlanta and Memphis areas. Uh, yes. And, and you know, and, and before Nationwide got Nationwide, you know, like Bobo and Thunderbolt, you know, they were big black stars in our business hmm. before, before the time. Uh, Tammy Sitch. Oh, Timmy Finch, Sonny. Sonny. 
<laughs> you know what? Uh, I was uh, in New York about a month ago, and the, the guy that I'm doing the show for, we're driving. He says, see this building over here? And I looked at it. It's an old rock building with Bobby. He said, Tammy Finch is in there. <laughs> she was in that prison there. But she just <laughs> got out. Did you know that? Yeah, uh, she's been in and out quite a few times, I've heard, yeah. Yeah, but uh, they just got her out. And uh, in the Smoky Mountain, uh, I'm wrestling Ken, Tammy's old boyfriend. Candido. Chris, Chris Candido, yeah. Yeah, Chris Candido and, uh, and Brian Lee. Now, in in this match, she told, they told me that, like, I'm going to power drive her. But I don't. And at that time, Tammy was really a butthole in that business. And uh, so she comes to me right there. Because we're fixing to go to rent. She goes, whatever you do, I don't have no panties on. <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't have no panties on. And you, what do you know? I, so I get in the ring. I go, like, I'm on power driver. When I do, I grab her dress and pull it over her head. <laughs> Hey, she was cussing me, and I went to the back. I didn't see her, right? And and that's just back. I didn't see her. Then all of a sudden, here she comes around the corner. She pointed that face at me. She said, I was mad at you for pulling my dress up. She said, but I just sold $500 worth of Polaroids. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'd never even come close to that, you know. Uh, then she liked me, uh, <laughs> but it was funny as hell. I was laughing my ass off too because I pulled that dress right over top of her. You don't tell me you ain't got no panties on <laughs> from you know 5,000 people. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Sonny tells a story once that um, she slapped you, and uh, you went, Jesus Christ, what did you do that for? and um, then you had to. Uh, make her realize how to do a slap properly in uh, the professional wrestling world. Oh, yeah. I told her. I mean, I grabbed the ring and slapped me. I mean, she slapped the piss out of me. I told her, I said, I, you know, I said, different words in the ring. I'm going, Jesus Christ, don't you know how to work? God, just slap me, man. And that hard, yeah, that happened in Smoky Mountain. That, that's when they didn't know. You understand me. Mm. There are businesses that work. It's a lot of things you can do. You know, it, even slapping, you know, and if you're a great heel or re just raking eyes is a lot. You get more heat than any, but if you got to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. At the time, Tammy was just starting in Smoky Mountain Rice, and she was, you know, greener than Al shit. <laughs> and beautiful. God, she was beautiful. Holy crap. And that was, this is way before she went to WWE, but she was beautiful. WL, rather, but she was beautiful. Gosh. But boy, could she be a, a bitch. <laughs> cool. um, Mr. Hughes. Curtis, uh, Curtis, Curtis Hughes. Uh, have you ever noticed on his hand, he had a broke, he played football for Dallas Cowboys. I don't know if you know that, but his hand broke. He's always shooting a bird. Did you know that? No, I didn't know. Oh yeah. You ought to see him. I bet a lot of times I'd be riding with him and people honk the horn, throw stuff out. Cause he's talking like this. He's got his middle finger always sticks up and it does all the time. Uh, but I watched him uh, come in and be a part of the York foundation before I joined it. Uh, then Curtis went into, you know, I was sharing a room with him one time. And uh, you, you don't even know he had sleep, sleep acne, acne. And let me tell you how loud he snored. He snored so loud that the guy in the room next to me called the room. I'm wide awake. I can't sleep. Hello? He goes, sir, I hate to bother you. He said, but I've got to catch an early flight in the morning. Is there any way you could turn that guy over in the, uh, or the goo or somebody's son? You're snoring so loud, I can't go to sleep. And it was Curtis, and we're in the next room over. I didn't go to bed all night. <laughs> That's how loud he snored. But then Curtis went through. You Have you seen him lately? He's really slimmed down now, hasn't he? Oh, gosh. He's probably lost 100 pounds. 
but he takes care of himself. I mean, he got back into the mode of uh, working out, running school. He runs a wrestling school too somewhere. But I, I see Curtis a lot on the independent circuit. Uh, he's still out there. I always had great matches with him, even when he was at the York Foundation. And he turned uh, heel, then he turned back baby face. But he, I, I like Curtis too. Did you ever, um, with Curtis, I've always heard two odd stories about him. One, he could sleep anywhere in any position. And two... Curtis? Yeah. And, That's uh, what I'm talking about. Yeah, he, yeah. He could, just, he could just he could just be stood completely straight and then just fall asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sleep, sleep acting, like higher uh, call it. apnea. Okay, now he could sleep, and what else did you say? Well, um, I heard a story. It was probably from Jim Cornette actually, that when he was bodyguarding Lex Luger, he used to tell um, the hotel people, the receptionist, that he was his actual bodyguard, and he used to just sleep in the hotel lobby for free. <laughs> but I probably did. I would. I, I would imagine. Uh, I never heard that, but I know Lex used to get on his ass. On, we'd be on the airplanes, right? We had our own. You know, Jimmy Crockett. You know, he bought an airplane. And Curtis would go to sleep on that son of a bitch. You know, especially you got a long flight back home, and nobody could sleep. I mean, Lex. Please quit snoring. Please quit. <laughs> Please. Yeah, but Curtis could. He'd be sitting in sure, just like this right here. <laughs> snoring loud, buddy. I'll, I'll give you two more, and then I promise we'll stop. Um, this is the controversial one I'm sneaking in here, uh, because I heard many years ago, this was doing the rounds, uh, that you weren't happy with Kevin Nash for something he said. And then somehow over 10 years, that became a war of words that ended up being like an internet main event pay-per-view. What was the sort of genesis of all that? Because I, I don't remember. Well, uh, yeah, I, I just made my own angle. Well, and, and, but some of it was true. You know, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and Eric Bischoff, they took over WCW. Uh, they signed, but, but listen to me, more glory to them. But see, I have to look something for me. You know, so I did it. I did a shoot interview on Kevin. You see, God, they signed herself to their own contracts. Uh, uh, millions, millions of dollars. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, damn, all I wanted to do, I would have took a job. Just give me a job. I put the ring up. I just wanted a guaranteed job, and I couldn't even get that. And that's, so I just cut an interview on him, all this stuff. And then the people, uh, you know, they bought it. And I talked to a guy named Marvin Ward, and I told him, I says, uh, Jesus Christ, man, we need Kevin need to have a match. And we did, and we did on pay-per-view. Listen to me now. It was the biggest payoff I ever got in my life. <laughs> and I did it on my own. You understand me? I mean, I got paid 2000 for the match, but I think off the pay-per-view, I made like $7,000. That's like nine grand for one night. I never made nothing like that. So uh, I don't know if, it, if Kevin was, but Kevin's one of the boys. So man, he he knew. You understand me? He knew everything. Too. Yeah, uh, he, but we, he, he knows and, business. And I have Kevin Nash with him too, huh? He knows business. Kevin Nash. Yes, and I had a hell of a match with him too. He's a big boy, and and you know Kevin's a he's believe it or not, he was a good worker. Hmm. <laughs> you know, he was in the position where he got. Per se, and he, you know, and he took care of his friends. What can I say? Hmm. I, well, you know, it's I never happened in wrestling before. I know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, yeah. uh, I'll give you the last one: the Iron Sheik. <clears throat> Don't say <laughs> USA. <laughs> hey, be live on the mic. This is back when you used to do all this stuff. You know, he he didn't care. He, you know, the Sheik. Yeah. Be on the bike. Don't say USA. God damn it. <laughs> it do that all the time. The Sheik, uh, I we were going to do TV in Columbus, Georgia. And I'm riding with Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin. And me and Sheik are in the back seat. And, I, and we're on the highway, interstate. And it has a sign roadblock ahead. Well, Michael Hayes. Hands back a big thing of pot about this big round, you know, an ounce pot. He told the sheep, throw it out the window. So sheep rolls the window down, but he don't throw it out. He just 
but he puts that in his pocket. Uh, so we go, but the roadblock is getting off at an exit. And we keep going, and Michael goes, God, man, we just threw my weed out. She pulls that big bag out, bag out. And Michael goes, uh, Oh, thank you, Sheik. He she go, thank you. Nothing. This belonged to Sheik. <laughs> <laughs> I threw yours out back there. <laughs> right? Oh, but funny. Uh, you know, he's he's a tough bastard too, man. He's he was tough in his day. He knew uh what to do and he it, but but I love working with him. God, he was so easy in the ring. It you know, it, when you have guys like that, they're that tough guys. They just let you sell for them, and they were good. I uh, I spent a lot of time with Sheik in Puerto Rico. Okay. I uh, thank you for uh, letting me do your interview, and I'm not trying to cut you short. Oh, no, please. Honestly, it's fine. I'm here at my house. My son just come. They just – I got to go sign for a lot of packages to come in. Uh, no worries, then. I will. Uh, I'll sign off. Thank you very much for watching. Ricky's. Uh, Ricky's got to go. Uh, so thank oh, you for yeah. watching, and I will I like, uh, see you next week. I like your background. I see your wrestling mask and all that stuff. Uh, do you know what? I'll. I don't hey. know if you can see it. My my wrestling school down in Chucky. I have. It's a museum. Check it out. Uh, oh, sat, uh, Sunday, I'll be on there. Okay. Before you go, you've got to do your plugs just before you go. Oh, yes, I be have, uh, have a live YouTube show that comes on School of Morton every Sunday at 5.05 Eastern Time. Ricky Morton, uh, Facebook Ricky Morton, Real Ricky Morton on Twitter, and School of Morton. Uh, thank you, guys. I wish you out there. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Ricky, and thank you for watching, and we'll catch you next week. Yeah. Cheers.